Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Welcome to this fun fellowship Friday night for the Church of the Eternally Secure CES. And the panel is raring to go. Oops, wait a second. We're missing Sister Angel right now. She was here, but uh, I'm sure she's, she'll be back. But uh, we, we have everybody on the panel ready to go. And uh, when uh, Angel gets here, we'll have the complete package. Uh, let's say hello to the congregation, and let's uh, start with uh, Sister Heather. Hello, brothers and sisters. I'm so glad I could be here tonight. Good to see so many smiling faces in the chat room. But they show no traces, do they? Smiling faces show no traces. Oh, I guess you're too young for that, Heather. I bet you Lisa <laughs> got it, though. Lisa, did you get it? No, I'm not old enough either. Are you serious? <laughs> no, I know smiling faces. Wasn't that uh, okay? There was a couple of different songs that referenced. I think that was uh, Motown, wasn't it? Wasn't that? Yeah, Motown, Motown and both yeah, of them were Motown songs. Well, actually, you show no traces of the evil that lurks within. Mm -hmm. I retract what I said because that doesn't. Smiling matter. faces tell lies too. <laughs> they don't tell the truth. <laughs> All right. Well, while I got you there, Sister Lisa, you go next and give a greeting for the congregation. Praise the Lord, beloved of the Most High God, in the mighty name of King Jesus. I'm glad to see everyone here this evening. Uh, oh, there's Sister Angel. I was just about to text you, girl, and see where you were. She popped in and she popped out before we started. We're like, oh, we need Angel. I miss my Angel. If I don't get my weekly dose of Angel, I get sad. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And everyone else, oh. Brother Ben, sister, uh, Brother Luke, Sister Heather, and Brother Steve. Did I miss anybody on the panel? No. And then everyone out in the chat, just glad you all are here. You know that uh, the things that are going on in the world right now can give people pause and make people a little unsettled. If we don't stay rooted and grounded and focused in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's our hope. So. Just stay focused on Jesus, y'all. We'll be all right. Yes. That's all I have to say for now. Okay. I'm glad to be here. Amen. Well, let's go to Sister Angel next. Uh, Sister Angel is the uh, only member of the panel that always comes with a message because her oh, name yeah. is message or messenger. <laughs> right, Angel? Oh, great. Set me up for a fall. I'm going to be able to live up to that expectation. Um, I'm a little bit sick, so if I uh, sound you to see, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, that is like the worst thing in the world to listen to <laughs> when someone's talking. But um, hi, guys. Yep, I, uh, uh, well, it looks like I, uh, I officially overdid it uh, during cold weather for the for the first time it happens like every year <laughs> where I, uh, I I work uh, out in the garage or something like that really late at night and then I get myself sick so but it, it, it'll go away uh, but it's like uh, every time it starts to get cold it, that happens it's just like an adjustment period I guess but um, so Sister Lisa that was so sweet of you I have uh, I, I have uh, something I want to show you I'll send you, I'll send you a link and maybe we'll uh, We'll go into our discussion uh, tomorrow. I believe uh, Renee will be on with us, but um, it's just good to be back with all of you. And um, I'll uh, I'll let somebody else take it from there before I <clears throat> uh, 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 cough again into the microphone. Okay. Well, I can tell that we're going to have to pray for you. Yeah. Uh, others, there's several people that we need to pray for. I'll, I'll tell you about that when we finish the greeting. Um, so let me see. We had the sisters all give a greeting. Uh, let's go with these brothers here. Brother Stephen? Hello. Hello. How are thou? Fantastico. Awesome. Uh, I, I would also like to uh, say hello to all the panel people, uh, Ben, Heather, and uh, 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 Lisa and uh, uh, Angel, and to say I'm glad to see you tonight, Angel, because we missed you last night on on my show, and we were worried about you. At least I was. So hope hope you're doing better. And oh, hope I, you I, feel yeah. better. <laughs> I'm I'm so sorry about that. I I was gonna I was gonna just talk. I was hoping to get on before the the show started tonight but i uh the thing kept disconnecting 
something like uh, with the with my phone, it would just I kept saying check my server. I don't even know what that means, but um, yeah, oh, I, I I basically fell asleep. Um, and Joel didn't he has a, uh, I didn't remember that I stream on Thursdays. I fat I fell asleep uh before, right before he got home, and he didn't uh, he didn't get me up once he got home because <laughs> he didn't remember. <laughs> and so I'm so sorry about that, guys. Yeah, I was oh, not feeling okay. good. But it's um, okay. uh, <laughs> um, but I was okay. I I, I should have. Uh, I didn't realize it happened until pretty late uh, uh, later on today. So I was just gonna wait to to, to talk to you guys about it tonight. But yeah, my, uh, that's my bad. I uh, I pushed it a little bit too hard. Uh, ben Ben knows I was I was thinking I was seeing demons and stuff in my garage really late at night by the time I was done cleaning. Because uh, uh, it uh, we have a had a huge mess out there. I started getting uh. I, I just uh, really pulled an all nighter and uh, got myself sick. It happens literally every every year as soon as the, the weather changes. Uh, it happens to me. But um, uh, <laughs> yep, I, I guess we have a lot of people to pray for. I don't know if everybody else is getting sick, but um, sorry about that, guys. I uh, I did not uh, mean to worry you. Mm-hmm. No problem. No chat. Mm-hmm. All right, brother Stephen, uh, have you completed your greeting? I think so. All Thank right. you, sir. Then let's move on to Brother Ben. Can you have a greeting for the congregation? Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I think something going. I, I I think there's something to the issue of. I've heard it. You know, where people have questioned the the, the reality of viruses, um, and I'm beginning to too to some degree. And but it does seem like everyone I know right now is. Uh, Angels doesn't feel well. I got I got sick, uh, and I didn't go anywhere. Um, and, uh, Renee, I know it's not yep. feeling well right now. And I think it may oh, really? be something to do with, with the weather, um, or something to that effect where your body has to readjust or something. Uh, mm-hmm. that was interesting. And so I, 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 I feel better now, but I, I, I did feel I was in a funk for a while. And, uh, yes, Angel, you were missed last night, but Kevin, uh, was, did, it was, it was a, uh, Kevin was there and that was a, I know there's no substitute okay. for Angel, but, uh, Kevin did a good job and it was, that was a re- we had a really great discussion. Hi. Um, and we have a good set of questions tonight. I pasted them in the hangouts if you want to check those out. And other than that, uh, let's get on in it. Mm-hmm. Okay, we also had Renee on last night, too. Oh, yeah, and, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, to let everybody know, real quick, if I might, uh, uh, the, the, the live stream will be up back up in a day or two. Uh, I had to remove two songs from the live stream, but it'll be back up. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Because I only uh, heard half of it, and I'm eager to hear the rest. The part that I heard was awesome. So, uh, okay, let me see. We everybody we've given a greeting to the congregation. So, uh, um, all right. So, uh, moderators are you're you're the deacons of the church. So, um, thank you for being there and. Uh, a big responsibility on you. Uh, you you you're there to greet the uh, the um, the members and and the guests. Uh, and, and then if there is any uh, issue that needs to be uh, dealt with, then we're counting on you to do it. Especially now that we have Sister Heather here, uh, she cannot focus on being a moderator now that she's on the panel. So we need to give her uh, a break there, so she can have all of her attention on this conversation we're having. So thank you, moderators. Uh, you're the deacons, and we we really appreciate what you do. Um, let me, before we go any further, say that I am aware of some prayer needs. Uh, I did get a, a message for someone today. I didn't want to wait till Sunday. So let me ask everybody to pray for this need uh, uh, t- tonight. Uh, this is uh, from... Um, Keltwin at AOL.com is where I got the message from, but it's it's from um, Kel, Kelly um, Kelly Garcia, and Kelly wrote, uh, Hi, Brother Luke. My name is Kelly Garcia. Screen name is Keltwin. I have been attending your church for a while now and participating in your fellowships and found them to be such a blessing. It has been a while since I have been on as I have had a personally personal tragedy in my family, and that is why I'm writing to you. Can you please ask for people to pray for my son, Victor? He is 17 years old and was just diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. 
they will be seeing how far the stage of cancer has spread next week. I'm praying that it is just stage one or two. Uh, he then will start his chemotherapy. I know that God can use this for his glory in some way. Thank you, Luke uh, Kelly. Uh, that's a message uh, we never want to hear. But uh, yeah, let's we'll all pray for, for Victor Kelly and your whole family. Um, pray for the family of uh, Lila and Boyce, uh, uh, friends of ours for many years. And Lila has just passed away a week ago at the age of 89. I think I mentioned to everybody at one of the recent programs that uh, uh, she and her husband have been to professing Christians for many years. But a few years ago at the dinner party at their house, uh, uh, we got in a conversation and, and I realized that they didn't really understand the gospel. So I was able to clarify it for them and the, the joy that, that came over them to, to learn that this uh, salvation is, is a, a real free gift and that it's guaranteed because of their faith in Jesus. Uh, it, it's just like a, a, a terrible burden and weight was removed and they, they just, their, their countenance, everything changed. So um, that they're having a funeral for Lila tomorrow. So pray for her family to help them deal with this loss. Um, also, Sister Renee, pray for her because she's uh, she said she was going to be here tonight with us, and then she had to cancel because she's she's not feeling well. Uh, all right, uh, anybody else want to mention anything else? Mm -hmm. Okay then. All right, so please uh, pray for these needs, not just now, but but each day try to remember to do that. All right, um, Ben, uh, the questions will be a surprise because you didn't send them to me in advance, so I'm eager to see what you, you have. Okay, the first question is, uh, it'll take me a minute to get the um, the post, give me, give me a minute to post it. Actually, I'll do it right now. Uh, uh, so true or false? Uh, Remember, this came from Heather or Hendrix, or maybe neither of them, but it is true or false. Spiritual growth is essential to everyone who has believed in Jesus. I think that was my question. Okay. Okay. Spiritual growth is essential to everyone who has believed in Jesus. Um, let me ask you to uh, elaborate on the question for a little bit. Uh, when you say essential, um, is, is this essential in order to uh, actually be saved, or is it essential to prove there's a real conversion? Uh, well, essential, she, essential in what sense, sister? Is it answered both ways? Answer both ways. I, you know, uh, every yeah. sense. Yep, pretty much. All right, all right then. Okay, let's go ahead, everybody. Um, if you haven't uh, learned how to do this yet, uh, Brother Ben posted the question in all caps. You can read the question, and next to it is a link. And you click on that, it'll take you to a place where you can actually post your your uh, your answer. Certainly true, leaning true, undecided, leaning false, or certainly false. Now we don't just want the panelists here to answer. We ask everybody in the congregation if it's at all possible. Please answer so we can see how the whole congregation uh, answers. And, and you can also elaborate with an explanation. Um, so go ahead and please, please answer that now. Uh, all right. So Heather, you submitted the question. And that means our policy is that you're going to go last. So uh, is there somebody eager to go first on this one? Hmm. Okay, I guess it's up to me. Uh, I, I say certainly false. Uh, uh, spiritual, wh whether a person grows and, and to what degree a person grows spiritually uh, should not be used as a test to if someone got saved or not. Uh, uh, I look at it this way. You know, let, let's compare the new birth to the natural birth for a moment. Uh, uh, it, it, if you have, uh, let's say, several people born right now, uh, physically from their mother's womb, 
we we don't we know that they're all humans not none of them are more human than the others um but will the people uh, grow and mature into productive human beings uh that's the question uh i think we can all agree that not everybody's going to really mature and they certainly are not going to mature to the same height and and the, the same rate uh but but even though one person maybe 20 th years from now 30 years from now they've already excelled at life they're they have everything that a person would call say they're very successful uh, and then another, the second person let's say that they also become successful but maybe much later in life at the age of 50 or 60 is when they 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 uh, come come into their own and excel and then another person uh, they don't ever seem to be successful at life they, they they even in their own eyes they consider themselves a failure they, they've never been able to excel at anything and and their their life is a disappointment to them and and their families uh, um, but in all three of these cases we don't say that how how well they succeeded at life determines how human they are and it's the same thing with, with uh, the new birth. If you have these three people that are all born again spiritually, uh, none of them are more born again than the other. You're either born again or you're not. Now, if we examine their lives over a lifetime, you'll see that maybe one of them ex excels and grows and matures spiritually and becomes, bears much fruit and, and, and uh, 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 it seems to be exemplary and, and at a young age. And then another person, they they grow and mature, but later. And then a third person, you just don't detect any maturity or, 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 or fruit in their life at all. And yet you cannot argue that any one is more born again than the other. At least we shouldn't. So that's how I would say that you need to uh, interpret the question or answer it. All right. Uh, who would like to go next? I'll go next. Um, I just entered my answer in the chat just, just to reiterate it. I said both true and false, depending on which way you're looking at the question. It's it's true if you want spiritual maturity. It's false concerning salvation. So it kind of just depends on which way the the question is is being spun or perceived by the uh the person that's examining the question. And, and as you said, you know, you would require further clarity and they said well go ahead and extrapolate on both which is fair because we should to avoid confusion but uh, I've often said that when a person gets born again the timetable if you will for lack of a better term if you had a stopwatch I don't get to have a stopwatch for you and you don't get to have one for me <laughs> it's in God's time for that person they're his servant. Who am I to judge another man's servant? The only thing I can do is judge their profession of faith. Now, if I see them, let's say we say, quote unquote, living a raggedy life, right? Then I don't want to be ensnared or entrapped or damaged by any fallout concerning the mess they're doing. So I would note and avoid, but I pray for my brother and sister if I perceive they're believer. And even if they weren't, I might uh, pray for them. So I might look at stuff they're doing and go, I'm not, I don't want no, I don't want no fellowship with that. That's fair, but I don't count them not a son or daughter of God if they have the profession of faith, which is according to this scripture. Jesus gave us the key to discern who's a believer. Who do they say he is? What do they profess about him, his word, what he's done? That's how we know whether or not they're in the faith uh, by their profession. Can I look in their heart and go for sure? No. And anybody would even try to do so, something ain't right. But when I look at that person, if I say, okay, their profession of faith is true according to the scripture, but they live in a raggedy lifestyle, I don't want to deal with that stuff. Then I'm going to put them on the note and avoid list, but I'll still pray for my brother and sister. They just may be a carnal Christian. There is such a thing. Now, what timetable before? They come 
to a recognition to be to begin to grow in Christ. That's between them and the Lord. I can't look at a stopwatch and go, oh, it's it's right about time. They should have grown up on that by now. And this is a mistake a lot of believers make. That person's going to be on the Lord's timetable. They're his child. That's why we should pray. We can encourage. We can uplift. If that person's in our life, because like there's a family member, there are times you got to note and avoid family members too that may be believers. And don't tell me it ain't possible. Just look at Lot. Lot ought to close everybody's mouth. So that's one example. Now, the, the other with regard to salvation, that's never in play. Because if that person has truly believed in Jesus, they are trusting in him. And I've found, I have found Christians, you could catch them doing something they ain't had no business doing. They'll hang their head. Yeah, why, why are you? They hang their head. I know it ain't right. But ask them who Jesus is. They tell you the straight up truth. They don't deny his deity. They don't deny he's, he came in the flesh. They don't deny that he's the only provision for sin. They don't deny he's the only way to heaven. And that is the only thing that will come out of their mouth. And they believe in it. They trust in it. They're not, oh, one day I'm over here at the church and the next day I'm at a Buddhist temple. There's no confusion. So this is what I'm saying. You know, some of these works righteous heretics, man, they, they're just, they're dangerous. They're dangerous. And they confuse everybody by putting the cart in front of the horse and then adding a stopwatch to it, which is not their business. If you're that concerned for somebody else concerning their walk, which is raggedy, if you have, and I'm going to be careful here because sometimes people think that they have an unction from the Lord to do stuff and the Lord ain't gave you no unction. Seek him before you even open your mouth. But if you really believe that, then pray for them. If you do have a way to speak into their life about things and you can do so in love and you're not going to drive them away from the Lord because that's something a lot of Christians do because they bring legalism and put it on the table and they make the person feel even worse and then they drive them away from the Lord. That's a whole nother thing. That's why you're going to be very prayerful about what you're going to say. If you're being led by the Lord, then speak. But you better make sure that's the Lord and not your flesh and your self-righteousness. And you don't do that anymore. Therefore, they shouldn't be doing it anymore. You got to be prayerful and careful with that stuff. I, I'll give this an example. Then I shut up. There was one time I was, I, I've told this before, but it's very important. People should hear it. I was at uh, work and there was a coworker who was a believer. And she had came uh like her, her spirit got stirred up again to return to things. You know what I'm saying? You've been a believer, but now it's time for some spiritual maturity. And the Lord was dealing with her about some things, but she was living with a man she wasn't married to who was a coworker. And, I, and everybody knew they were boyfriend and girlfriend. It wasn't no secret. So when she started talking about the Lord and stuff, I was talking, I was excited for her. I was like, yes, that's great. They were going back to church. And she had two teenage daughters, like very young, 13, 14 kind of thing. and. I went to open my mouth to say, well, sister, you know you can't continue to live with him and you're not married. I literally opened my mouth, took the breath to say the word, and the Lord said, don't say that. And I closed my mouth. And while she's talking to me and telling me, still fired up about the Lord, what they plan on doing and everything, she didn't say anything about that. She just talking about what the Lord has showed her. He said, don't say that because if you say that, you're going to damage her. You're going to get offended and it's going to take me years to get it straight. That's literally what he told me. So Amen. I closed my mouth. <laughs> I closed my mouth. There's a time, y'all, for everything. Timing is everything with the, with the Lord. Go back through this Bible. You'll look. Sometimes you it can be the right thing to say, but it ain't the right time to say it. Amen. So I was quiet. Now, this, the Lord always bears witness to the truth. He always gives his word with signs following. About three or four months later, because she was a co-worker that worked a different shift. I was seeing her when I was on my way out. She was on her way in. Well, it had been a while. I hadn't seen her. Then one morning, I'm, I'm going out because I work nights. She's coming in. And we bumped each other. We had a minute to chat. And she said, sister, I just wanted to tell you. She said, the Lord ministered to me. She said, I'm not, I'm not supposed to be living in with this man I'm not married to. So I'm going to separate from him and we're going to come back together in marriage and do it right because you know my girls and I'm 
have to say nothing. Why? I keep telling people the Holy Spirit got their number. Just like he could tell me, he can tell them. That's why it's better to open your mouth in prayer for them than to say the wrong thing. You really do have to be led of the Lord. I get so tired of people going, oh, the Lord told me and told me and told me. And then you see the damage that they do. Well, was it really the Lord when it did damage, when it didn't bring healing, when it didn't lead that people to to the Lord, didn't lead them to the Lord, but drove them away? Was it? So, OK, that's going to be on you because you said the Lord told you and you opened your mouth and did that. You better be right. So just be prayerful, beloved. Sometimes it's your flesh telling you and it ain't the Lord. So there are times to be quiet. But if in that being quiet, I still prayed for her. I heard what the Lord said. I still prayed for her. And then he confirmed his word later on. He ministered to her. She corrected that. I didn't have to say a word. So that's an example. That's why I'm saying it depends on what we're talking about. And this, even this type of thing, even this question, which is a great question, by the way, d requires spiritual maturity to answer because a babe would not answer this question the same way. But that's OK. It's a babe. You know, like when a babe come in the room, little baby say something and y'all, everybody smile. And go, OK, baby, we understand because it's a babe. We don't attack the babe because it's a babe, but we can show them the truth about what the word says. Hopefully they'll receive it. Sometimes they won't. Sometimes babes storm off with a temper tantrum, temper tantrum and get a little upset and walk away. But that's OK. We pray for them. Encourage the babe. Hey, this is just what the word says. So there's times for all things. But we do have to be prayerful and careful, beloved, and not get in our flesh, even in answering people. Because if we do, then we can do more damage than good. And that's all I have to say. Woohoo. Wow. Awesome. Man, that's. A lot of wisdom packed into that answer. <laughs> Very good. Very good. All right. Yeah, I just um, wanted to say, I'm just going to go ahead and say amen to what she said. And just, you know, because I don't think I could cover it any better. That was, that was how, how in the world are you going to follow that, Angel? Maybe I can't. Your, wait, let's, let's. It would just be fake and strained. I mean, <laughs> she, she could have covered it. Her. Sister, let's make Ben. <laughs> and after Ben. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, <laughs> oh, yeah. Bless his heart. All right. Well, I'll take a different angle, uh, as I usually do. Um, and uh, I would say, well, I think the, the, the parable of the sower is a good application for this question because uh, it, it addresses both both the salvation, uh, the growth in the salvation sense and growth in the uh, sanctification, sanctification, spiritual growth. Uh, a maturity sense and jesus said in luke uh three that uh you know he's the he's the sower and the the seed is the word of god and he gives a uh three four character uh, categories of of ground essentially which the ground is essentially uh, uh an allusion to the human heart and he says only the first uh soil was unsaved in fact he defines the the the, the meaning of the parable in luke 8 he says that only the, the, the first soil uh, that, oh, I'm sorry, of the first soil, yes, he says that they that Satan takes the seed uh, uh, away from their heart lest they believe and be saved. So right there, he's telling you right there what's what's required to be, what's the what's the uh, other, what's the category for growth? Uh, it, it's whether you believe or not. So uh, the other four soil, the other three soils he gives as different uh, are saved believers, the seed germinated. So that germination is essentially new life, which represents the new birth. And so where there's new life, there's new birth. But the other three soils had different degrees of uh, spiritual maturity based on really the heart uh, and what the heart was exposed to over the course of its life. And, uh, and so that each of the different uh, uh uh, soils uh, gave for br brought forth different degrees of fruit. Um, in fact, Jesus says that if you don't understand this parable, how will you understand the other parables? Uh, and, and, and by extension, I would say if you don't understand that parable, uh, you will misunderstand um, a lot of scriptures. But namely, you'll misunderstand uh, Second Peter, Jude, and Hebrews because I believe uh, Hebrews and 
Second Peter in particular are direct applications of the parable of the sower. And I'll go into that in a minute. Um, and so, uh, like I mentioned, so the the jerk and also oh, so one people something people will say, well, no, they see Matthew gets a different telling of that parable, and he says that only the last uh, fruit or last seed gave or soil gave birth to abundance of fruit because they understood. Well, the Luke is really a, 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 I believe an account of Jesus' earthly ministry from a, from a uh, from for for a Gentile audience. So it's, it's it's kind of designed to tell the Gentile world what happened to the promised kingdom. It didn't come, and so why did it? Why didn't it come? And so it answers that question for Gentiles, and. The and, P, and, and Matthew does the same thing, but it does it to a, mostly a Jewish audience. It answers to the Jews why didn't the why didn't the kingdom promised kingdom come? Um, and the reason why it didn't come is they did not receive its king. And the reason they did not receive its king is because they didn't understand the scriptures, and that's why the word uh, understanding is emphasized in Matthew's account because uh, the whole idea is that they didn't understand the scriptures. They they were blind. They did. They should have anticipated uh, his uh, visitation. He was talking to them right in front of their face. They still didn't see him for who he was, and that's why the kingdom was postponed. God's promises did not fail, but simply the kingdom, earthly kingdom, is postponed for a future date, and that's why Matthew emphasized uh, uh, understanding in his parable because that was a common theme, I guess, uh, in the in the ancient world would they repurpose. That's why there's differences in the Gospels, too. I find this fascinating uh, that, you know, because there's different accounts. Th th there's a lot of similarities between the synoptics, but there's also differences. And that was a common thing back in the day uh, when in the ancient world, when they wrote biography, they didn't do it in, in, like we, we they didn't record history like we do today. And today, uh, histor history is recorded very uh, matter of fact. Uh, try to We try to be exacting. Uh, you know, in true to the actual sequence event of events as possible, where in the ancient world that was not the case at all. What they wanted to do was to capture the essence of the person they're writing the, the biography about. So it's very common for them to rearrange stories, um, change the order slightly, put a different emphasis or a spin on a on on a on a teacher saying. That was a very common thing. Uh, Mike Mike Lacona uh, has a great book. It's called Why Are There Differences in the Gospels, and he talks about how this is this was. Uh, done in the ancient world, uh, he, he he uses the account of Plutarch, who was who was an ancient historian, and how he would uh, would do that. And and and, it, and again, it's a Greco-Roman biography it was a very common practice. So I found that was fascinating. Anyways, back to the uh, parable of the sower. Um, I believe that um, again, the germination of the seed means new life. That person is born again. Now, whether or not they will uh, grow into maturity and produce fruit, that is totally dependent on them continuing to believe and them uh, continuing to yield to the Holy Spirit and not allowing the world to uh, come in and sm snuff it out, essentially. Um, and I believe that's exactly what, uh, again, Second Peter talks about, for example, because he says in Second Peter uh, that, uh, let me find it real quick here. So he says, Second uh, Peter says, uh, essentially to its audience, he says in, in verse Second Peter 1 3 says, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given, which by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And having escaped the corruption in the world through lust, it doesn't mean they're not going to uh, ever, uh, you know, have a lustful thought or be caught up in, in a lustful sin or anything else. And I, I believe that's a positional statement: is that they've been crucified to the world, and the, and the world has been crucified to it. Uh, all when you believe in Christ, all your passions and lusts have been crucified with Him. So that's a positional statement. But then he says, "But also for this very reason." So again, because you have these precious promises of being born again, and and and, and all these. Uh, 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 opportunity for rewar rewards, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtual now into virtual virtue knowledge, to knowledge self control, self control, to perseverance, perseverance to godliness, etc. 
Because he says, and again, this is the this is the tie-in with the parable of the sower. For if these are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he so that that's a, again that fruitful, barren, that's that's a, a direct parallel to the parable of the sower. And he says, For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, like he saw, even to blindness, he has forgotten that he was cleansed from his own old sins. So that means he was, you know, the old man's dead, uh, it, it, but uh, he's become blind to it. For therefore, brethren, if, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. And if, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. And Renee just did a great video on this uh, this verse here. And that's part of the reason it's, why it's on my mind. Uh, and that stumble there, I'm convinced, means doesn't mean like just, you know, uh, have a, a moment of weakness, but it's, it's, it's stumbling into apostasy. Because he then proceeds to warn them that false teachers are coming. And what they're going to do is uh, twist the scriptures and turn the grace of God into lewdness or license. Um, and, uh, it, it, and it, if they do, if they fall, it's a come to that false teaching. He says, if they are again in, uh, uh, entangled and overcome, again, entangled and overcome, that's a direct parallel to the parable of the sower, where he says, that the second uh, soil um, was choked out by the cares, riches, and pleasures of this life, and and so I believe again, Second Peter is a warning not to, to it is to grow. It, it's essential to grow so that we don't fall into apostasy or we don't fall into false teaching, and um, because if you do that, you'll become like a, a, a dog that uh, that returns to its vomit or a sow that returns to its wallowing. Uh, again, it's, it's has nothing to do with your position in Christ, but your condition in time will be, uh, instead of partaking in the divine nature, you'll be partaking in the beast nature, which is the flesh. And, uh, you'll sow to that, which is just, so you'll, you'll reap corruption. Uh, and so again, I think that the third soil is a picture of Peter is talking about the third soil where you're choked out by the cares, riches and pleasures of this life by false teaching. And the Hebrews is also warning about falling to apostasy, but that instead of falling into uh, the ditch of license, I believe it's a falling to the ditch of legalism where you fall back and in, back into the law. And that's the second uh, soil uh, where, where it says thorns sprang up and choked it. So thorns is a picture of law or the curse of the law, I believe. And so again, uh, I think the parable of the soul is a great application here. Because he said, again, Christ says, if you don't understand that parable, well, then you're not going to understand my other parables. And I think by extension, you're not you're going to misinterpret Hebrews. You're, you're going to misinterpret uh, Second Peter because both of those epistles use uh, language from the parable of the sower. And um, and so, I, yes, I do think it's essential for our growth for, for the purpose of rewards and for the purpose of not falling into error. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. I think it, it was well done. I think I agree with your uh, point and the, using that parable and to answer the question, uh, you talked about how you respond to the Holy Spirit will determine whether you're growing or, or not. And I was in a conversation with Victoria earlier to, today, and we, we were talking about grow, growing or not. And I, I, I've used this example before. It's, it's who are you going to feed? Once you're born again, will you feed the old man or will you feed the new man? Uh, if you you feed one and starve the other, and that's what happens. You're either if you're not feeding the new man with Bible studies, prayer, fellowship, ministry works, uh, you're uh, you're not going to grow without feeding him. And uh, so I would say do everything you can to feed the new man and starve the old man, and, th and that will assure that you're going to be growing and maturing. Uh, let me see. Uh, Brother Steve, um, wait, we we're going to have Angel follow Ben, right? What do you think, Angel? Oh, that's why when, when after Lisa was done, I just said I seconded everything because I, I really feel like that, you know, everybody's really just covered it so well. Um, I don't, I, when I think of the word essential, all I can, I, I can't disconnect that word from okay. the idea of like essential for salvation in my mind. So I would say false. It's not essential in that sense, but it is. Um, in my experience, it's a little bit, uh, inextricable in the sense that I had, uh, you know, just, just becoming, um, 
humble enough to even accept the gospel and uh, being being able to see the truth finally, being able to actually be honest enough with yourself um, just to see through the world of lies that uh, that makes us all so puffed up that we reject this this free gift. Uh, you know, most of us forever. Um, you know that that entails a, a kind of growth. I mean, it, for me, it, it's not that it's not what saved me. It was just such a big step from from the blindness of my youth. Um, so you know, and I think that's the kind of uh, growth that God can really work with. You know, and we all we we can we can choose to uh, we can choose to to quench the work He's trying to do in us. Uh, I think, but I also believe that. Um, that a lot of it with self-honesty will come naturally. Um, if you talk to God and you're close with God, you will uh, at least have some measure of growth. This is why the works righteousness heretics, they never can answer this question. What counts as fruit? What counts as improvement? Like when they say you have to improve to be saved. Uh, well, you're going to have some level of improvement. I mean, it, you, there's almost nobody that even a lost person you know, uh, it's almost impossible to measure these things. So I think that's, a, you know, it, it's leavened when we try to, uh, when we try to uh, look at the, look at another person's, um, uh, how well, we deem their growth to be from an outside perspective, um, not knowing their, really their, their relationship with God, not knowing where they started out in the first place. You know, this this prideful spirit comes in where we want to fruit inspect them. Even in the grace community, some people supposedly in the grace community will do this, um, and it's it's totally arbitrary. And really, they're just they're not measuring the, these people. They're not judging these people against the standard of Christ. They're doing it against their own. They're measuring these people against themselves and what they think of themselves to be. Um, but I think that for me, and actually just knowing. Knowing the truth, knowing that his word is true, knowing uh, that he he created us in his image, knowing um, that every everything he says in that book, you know, that, that that's kind of the instruction manual for life. That is the, the final arbiter of truth for us. Um, I'm still I'm still in awe of of just uh, <laughs> the growth that uh, that's come just from just from knowing the truth. And I think we, we really appreciate just just how stunted uh, we are when we don't we have these just very basic coordinates of where we are and what the world is the world is being very rude and uh, uh so you know i i think that uh uh this is just kind of the nice that's the, that's the good news lucy you better stop and um, uh, the good news is is that we you know you kind of uh, can't help but grow if you actually align yourself with God's word, at least recognizing the truth of it and, and rejecting the lies of the world, um, that'll give you a really big head start uh, compared with uh, with most people today who have no idea where they are, who they are, why they're here, who God is, if there's a God. Um, and so try not to, you know, try not to judge yourself too harshly um, uh, and just, uh, just try to just try to check all of your, you know, all of the things that you assume to be true against the word of God. And it's a really, uh, you know, and be humble enough to let go of it if it doesn't line up. And that in and of itself, that I mean, that did wonders for me. That that just right there, starting off as a new believer, that was a really big, a, a really big step, and um, made a lot of things a lot easier uh, for me uh, when it comes to uh, spiritual growth. But uh, listen, I was starting out in like the deepest possible trench uh, as an atheist. So for me, uh, I, I, you know, I had a long way to go. My, my transformations are pretty uh, stark because of it. So uh, if you were you grew up in the church and you were like a reasonably uh, decent, sane person, unlike, you know, atheists and people my age these days, maybe, uh, maybe it's a little bit harder to improve. But for me, I was starting out so low. And I'm just, uh, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still coasting, I feel like, because I had a long way to, I had a long, I was, it was just real, it was real bad. But uh, anyway, that, that, that I'm going to go uh, deal with my screaming kids now and mute before they interrupt again. Mm. And you said you didn't have anything to say. Mm -hmm. I, uh, well, yeah. I think my little girl did. <laughs> Well, what she's done is she's caused me to think of some more questions for her. I remember when we did our interview, uh, I don't remember uh, all this uh, 
debauchery and, and a, a uh, atheistic uh, de depravity that she was in. I need to I need to re-interview you, Sister Angel. Get more details. Okay, oh, sounds good. Okay. <laughs> sounds good. All right, uh, brother, brother Stephen, you've been waiting a long time. Do, do you have a lot to to say about this, or has it all been said? <laughs> uh, did Heather go already? No, Heather goes last because she she wrote the question. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I, I knew I now I remember what she, she she said. Yeah, she asked the question to be answered from both sides. Yes, okay. Um, that was what when she talked. Um, okay. So ditto, 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 ditto. <laughs> um, but also, I, I just want to highlight a couple things. Um. Uh, that that have been said that I just 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 I thought was awesome. Uh, one uh, I'll I'll answer first from the salvation side. Um, one that would be uh, no, uh, absolutely unequivocally no. Spiritual growth does not happen until after salvation. Um, and I, I really love what Angel had to say, though I would not call that spiritual growth. I would call that from pride to humility to be able to be in a place to believe. Uh, and I, I think right. that right. part of that's on my mind is because that's exactly what we talked about last night was, was humility being essential in belief. That, that that has to happen. You have to come to a place of, of humility before God because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace, which is what saves us, to the humble. Um, so th there's that. I think that, that there's that. And there's a lot of people today that talk about being spiritual and it's very new agey and all that kind of thing, and that doesn't save anybody unless they are saved, then they could have real spiritual growth in the Lord. Um, so, so there's that. And uh, Lisa like said almost everything that I had first wanted to say. And it was beautiful. <laughs> yep. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful what she said. And I really want to focus in on on the story that she said that was just absolutely amazing with two verses from the Bible. And I want to point out why I do believe in the life of the believer that spiritual growth is very much essential, not for salvation, but for our walk and for how we impact the lives of others, both believers and the lost. That's why we are, that's the whole reason is so that we can become like what Ben was talking about. We can become the, the fourth seed that had 30, 60, 100 fold fruit increase. And I believe personally that that fruit is other people because when a, when a tree drops, when a tree grows fruit, it drops seeds. That's it. That's what happens. Um, so, uh, Romans, I was just talking about this with the brother earlier. Uh, and before I say this, I want to highlight something Hendricks had said that I thought was just awesome. Uh, growth is essential in that whether in whether it's this life or the next, God will ultimately glorify you. Not essential on our part, but required of God. I thought that was just just awesome, and it's true because that's our promise and sure hope. That, that he will glorify us, whether we have the growth of the, the second seed, the third seed, or the fourth seed. Um, but Romans chapter 12, 
verse 1 and 2. And it also tells us in these two verses how to grow, how to have spiritual growth, and why it's so important. Romans, come on, Romans 12, not 1. <laughs> I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? I'd also like to read in another translation that might make it a little more plain for those that have trouble with the King James language. This is in the NIV. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. So that's, that's how you offer your body as as a holy and pleasing sacrifice by not being conformed to the pattern of this world, but by being transformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you do that? Through the washing of the water of God's word. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Why do I highlight these two scriptures? Because Lisa's story highlights exactly what happens when we become more spiritually mature. We are able to test and approve what God's will is in situations where she heard, could recognize the voice of God, and here, because she studied and learned how God speaks, to hear, no, don't say that right now. That was beautiful. And to hear that God still knew what he was doing. And I've heard it said like this. Two, two phrases. Stop trying to be the Holy Spirit for other people. Pray for them and listen to the Holy Spirit in your own life. Secondly, I have enough trouble keeping my own porch clean. You know, I have enough tr trouble trying to keep my own porch clean to worry about trying to, to go and sweep up other people's porches, I'm going to end up having a uh, lack of cleanliness in my own life. So what she said was so critically important. Ecclesiastes tells us there's a time for everything. There's a right time. And she's right. There are the right words, but they're in the wrong time. You will mess up somebody else's walk we need we do need to be very careful and this is why that if we offer our bodies to god say use me god and then as we walk with him try to let go as the scripture says for those that name the name of christ we are to depart from iniquity okay that's what we're supposed to do but be transformed by the renewing of our mind as we have offered our bodies a living sacrifice. Try not to be conformed by the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the word of God so that 
in these times and places and moments, we're able to know what to do in these situations in the right way so that we don't damage someone because we don't know where they're at in their walk. So it's incredibly essential for how we treat other people and how we demonstrate, not only speak the gospel, but how we demonstrate the gospel in the earth, which I believe is exactly what James is all about. It's how we demonstrate the gospel to others. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Well, that's a lot of really good answers. I can see that we've spent about an hour already on this one question. So everybody had a lot to say about it, but the last word is going to go to Sister Heather since you created the question. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I get a lot of inspiration from a lot of different places when I submit questions. And believe it or not, this one came from my three-year-old. Um, I always said that I would never have a picky ear in my family. And I was so determined that I would not have a picky eater that I learned how to cook everything that way. And I would always have something to offer everyone. Um, but I have one of those children who everything must be a carb or cheese and it must be white. If there's any brown on his bread, he wants it cut off. And it got me thinking because no, you Thank don't. Thank you, Heather. Yes. I know. You I don't have to. Yeah. And you don't have to grow to prove your salvation because who are you proving it to anyway? My salvation, I prove that to me every day by my desire and my, my, my hunger for the word. And that's not something that I have done because that's not me. I'm not a reader. I'm not a seeker or a searcher. I've, I'm not a studier. I barely passed my classes in high school because I didn't study. The only reason I, I passed is because I paid attention in class and got A's on my my um, tests. Otherwise, I would have failed over and over and over again. But so this is not me. I don't dig in. That's not the kind of person I am. So that's that's how I test my salvation is. And it's mine. It's not anybody else's. But it's, it's through my desire to spend time in this book. Um, and. As far as um, with with my son, though, I've I've watched the difference between my eight year old and my three year old. The way that they've grown, my my eight year old got thicker and then got taller, got thicker and then got taller, and it was like every year I was having to buy him a, a new size clothes. But with my three year old, he's been in size two T clothes since he was. 18 months he's tall and skinny and doesn't really grow and I think I thought I was looking at him one day and thinking about the 18 years that I spent believing what the church fed spoon fed me um and believing that I had to repent of all my sins and believing that I had to chase after Jesus because nothing that I could ever do was ever good enough and then I about two years ago, three years ago, I realized because of the YouTube videos and the, the YouTube ministries that I was watching, namely Renee, um, that I I was chasing Jesus around grace and he was never running. He was sitting still, probably watching me, wondering why I kept running around this thing that he had already given me. But I wasn't growing. I wasn't maturing at all. And every every day I would mess up and I'd be like, oh, again, here I am on my knees praying for forgiveness for something that I did. And I know I'm just going to do it again tomorrow. I know I'm going to mess up, but I'm, I'm, I just don't know how to get out of this cycle. And it wasn't until I started, well, until I really understood what grace meant and and what it meant for my life 
that first of all, I stopped running and I sat down and you know what? It's amazing how much time you have to actually sit down and read once you stop running. It's crazy. And I sat down and I have read and I have dug and God has revealed things to me. And even something as silly as the verse of the day on you version this morning spoke to me. And it was just one verse. But I was like, okay, this verse, I, I'm, I'm just hearing Renee in my mind saying, okay, but read it in context. So I read the whole entire chapter. Um, the verse was Matthew 6, 19. And it says, do not lay, and this is um, New King James. I'm sorry, guys. I just have such a hard time reading the King James. I don't understand it when I read it. Um, when Kev reads it, though, I totally get every word that, that, I, that he's read. I don't know why. Maybe it's his accent. Anyway, um, verse 19 says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures in, on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And, you know, I've always heard that in tithing rants at the beginning of, of a of a you must give kind of kind of speech at church. So I kind of ignored it because it, it really bothered me. But after reading this whole entire chapter, I have come to the conclusion that this chapter is about worrying entirely. Everything in it is about worrying because um, if, I do my, if I do my good deeds in front of other people and I stand on the street corner and very loudly proclaim, I am giving this poor person money. This homeless person is broke and I have extra money, so I'm going to give it to them. That's about worry. And the reason it's about worry is because I am, by, by proclaiming this, I'm trying to get the same kind of reaction from God that I would expect to get from man. And in my worry that I'm not doing enough, I'm, I'm trying to show it to the world and show it to God that I'm doing this and please acknowledge it. And, you know, the prayer, it's about, it's about the same thing, laying up treasures in heaven. So what are the treasures that we lay up in heaven? It's not money. It's not the good things that I've done. It's not feeding the poor. It's not anything like that. It's the people that I take hand in hand when I walk through the gates of heaven. And that is my treasure who I took with me, not what I took, because I don't take anything with me, just the people. And so I, I, was, I was going to share this at some point tonight, but when Brother Steve was talking about the, the treasures being the people, it's, it's so true. What we take with us, that is the people. The seed that we plant becomes people who believe in Jesus. And that's what we're called to do. And that's how we know that we've matured. And I, I just, I don't know. I've kind of lost my train of thought, but I, I, that's, that's what I wanted to say. Okay. All right. Thank you, sister. Well, uh, we, uh, I found the whole uh, subject, uh, the question and answers to be fantastic, very interesting. Not a moment was I bored. It was uh, very worthwhile. Um, I, but I normally what we do is we have a second round where we see if there's a follow up. Uh, but we spent more than an hour on this question. So un unless you're eager to stay on this subject, I, I, I'd say that we could forego the second round so we can move to the next question. Unless there's something you want to say as a follow up that you think is really important. Any, anything? All right, then. Great question and great answers by all. Uh, all right, Ben, why don't we go to the next question? Okay, this one is from um, Mia Pratt, and it is true or false. Uh, God allows unbelievers to prosper while believers always suffer. Hmm, okay. Um, 
Let me see. Um, let me reverse the order th this time here, uh, if it's all right. If it, uh, Heather, would you mind going first on this one? Yes, that's fine. I was submitting my answer. Okay, um, I would say certainly false. Um, I don't think that... I know that there are people out there who live their lives you know whatever they don't they don't believe in jesus and they they live their lives however they want and they seem to prosper and there's a lot of us um who do believe who it seems like maybe we're we're falling on hard times and we just don't understand where this is coming from or why god allows it but i heard something once and i don't know where i heard it it may have even been on here but it really spoke to my heart and it was this that our time here on this earth is as close to hell as we will ever get and for a non-believer the time that they spend here on this earth if they never believe is as close to heaven as they will ever get so that gave me some perspective like Okay, so they're they're prospering. Great. Let them enjoy it. Pray that they get saved and that that's not all they get. But if they never get saved, then at least they've had a life that that has blessed them, that God has blessed them in. And I don't know. I I just I see it as as that that I get I have something wonderful to look forward to. And life really stink sometimes and it's okay and i understand there's a lot of us that struggle but we've got something better to look forward to mm -hmm. okay thank you all right brother stephen okay well, while he's trying to find his microphone, I'll go ahead and answer then. Uh, Maybe he doesn't answer to Stephen, but Steve. Well, Steve? <laughs> I'm teasing. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I, I answered certainly false. Uh, and, and the reason was really mostly because when, when it says always, I tend to uh, shy away from giving absolutes. Uh, I think that... <laughs> This is one of my, I call it a pet peeve, but it, it's really more serious than that. And, and that is dogmatism, uh, where, where people uh, um, get, make absolute declarations and it's impossible that they could be wrong. Uh, uh, that's a very dangerous thing, but I see it happen almost, almost automatically. Uh, uh, when you get a, a, a new believer and they don't know much about the Bible, if at all, if anything, except the gospel. And then if they decide to get serious and start studying the Bible, um, those who get really serious about Bible study, unfortunately, um, maybe a year later, they're authorities and they they want to teach and 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 declare what uh, these absolute truths and and say that others are heretics if they disagree. It, it, it doesn't even take more than a year for a babe to turn into a dogmatist. It's very sad to me. Uh, I, I think people need to stay humble, not not think that they've got uh, the absolute correct answer to everything, uh, and, and keep on learning. Uh, but uh, so I would say, because it has always suffer, I would say no. That's that's not. Uh, that's certainly false because I, I, it's not going to be true 100% of the time. Now, will believers suffer? Uh, well, Jesus said, don't think uh, uh, that, uh, no, he says, if, if they did this to me, look what, imagine what they're going to do to you, how you will be persecuted. And throughout all of church history, uh, the, the, the church has always gone through tribulation and persecution. And uh, it, why should it be any different for us at this time in history? Uh, we will we will suffer too for our faith. If you're not suffering for your faith, then you've, you're probably been pretty good at keeping it secret. Uh, that's what I call closet Christians. It's very safe to not talk about your faith and be and say it's a personal, private thing for me. And it could very well be, but uh, 
uh, we're, we're supposed to, if nothing else, share the gospel. And, and uh, if you do uh, start talking about Jesus and tell people, want to tell people the good news, uh, you are going to suffer some kind of persecution. It's That is inevitable. Um, now, God always allows unbelievers to prosper. Uh, he allows it uh, because, see, the, the rules of the world are in, in a corrupt world, uh, and to to succeed or to let's say let's say the the measurement is is wealth. Uh, it, it, sometimes people gain a lot of wealth and they're absolutely corrupt and dishonest and and just horrible in every way. But that seems to be the ways of the world and within those rules, uh, which is anything's okay as long as for me uh, as long as I get ahead. Um, those who who don't have any. Um, uh, restrictions on them, like we have restrictions because the Holy Spirit is and the scriptures are telling us how, how we are to behave. Um, we, we don't get saved because we behave. We get saved because we believe. But then after we believe, uh, it, as we start to change, we're going to find out that, uh, uh, yeah, our, not only will we have persecution, but uh, we're under standards of, of character and morality and these things do affect should affect how we live and our decisions but the people who are not under that the the world as a whole they're not restricted by uh, you know, ethics so they, they can succeed because they don't have any limitations they can do whatever they want to succeed because ethics are not going to enter into their decisions so yeah many times you see people prosper who, uh, who are not believers uh, and uh, believers are uh, maybe not prosper but as we discussed in the last question, we may be very prosperous uh, in terms of treasures in heaven. Uh, Brother Steve, um, is your uh, everything working now? Are you ready to go, to go next? Sure. Go ahead. Sure. Um, there's a lot of proverbs that speak to this. If you were to look up, and I haven't uh, yet, also Ecclesiastes. Um, uh, to, has some has some reference to this um, about if you were to look up the key words uh, the wicked and and prosper um, and so I definitely definitely you know. Uh, with what Luke said, I think that was spot on. And I loved what Heather had to say. And I would just, uh, off, I just wanted to throw a little bit of encouragement to you, Heather, you know, uh, if, if the King James troubles you and you can read the King, J the new King James or, or another version of the Bible and you're reading it in context, that's wonderful. You know, read a version that, you can understand, and this goes for anybody, whether you're on the panel or, or in the, uh, in the chat, you know, I would, I would suggest, you know, uh, that, that you understand how your version was translated. You know, uh, King James is, is, is one of the most uh, direct and literal translations, uh, and other translations are thought for thought translation. Um, like the NIV that I like as well. Uh, and Luke uses the amplified a lot on, on Wednesday night. And I, I love that version too. Um, because it amplifies things. <laughs> it gives more for, for our study. And, and I think that's great. You know, context matters so much, no matter what version of the Bible you are reading uh, with exception of a few that I would say burn, burn it. Um, literally there's, there's the rainbow Bible, not the King James rainbow Bible. There's literally a Bible called the rainbow Bible. And it is, it was written in support to try to, uh, uphold homosexuality as being not a sin and being okay. I'm not saying, please hear me. I am not saying if you have, struggles with homosexuality that you cannot be saved. That is absolutely unequivocally false. We just need to know we're a sinner and we need a savior. And that includes all sin. Any sin slew me. 
And James says, if I've committed one sin, I'm guilty of them all. So I'm just as guilty as the homosexual. And just as in need of a savior, as a homosexual, as a pedophile, as a murderer, as an idolater, as, as children that are disobedient to their parents. All of those things. But I'm off track a little bit. But uh, so anyway, I said all that to say, don't use that Bible, the, the rainbow Bible, because it's not biblically accurate. And don't use this new mirror Bible, which is a Luciferian translation. OK, so those two I would burn. Um, but other than that, most translations are good. And if you line them up with the King James, that might help you understand the King James better. Um, and that's what Luke does on Wednesday nights a lot. So with the Amplified, uh, and uh, it's awesome. So, uh, but th why do the wicked prosper? Jesus tells us in the Gospels that that's their reward if they believe not. Also, if any person follows the wisdom that's in Scripture, even if they decide to never believe in God, a lot of businesses use use the wisdom that's found in Proverbs to help their companies grow. But they're not a Christian company or a Christian-led company, but these biblical principles work because it's God's law, because it's true. So, you know, you can be successful, but that's all you're going to get. You have no hope and no future without Christ beyond this life. And that's a very sad thing to gain the whole world, but lose your soul. As Jesus said, what profit, what profits a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? That's what Jesus said. So do, and Jesus said, yes, we will suffer in this life. You will have tribulation. The servant is not greater than the master. Jesus is the master. We are his servants. And yes, he suffered persecution. We will too. He suffered, uh, you know, uh, and we will too. So he's not, you know, that that's missing from a lot of today's preaching, you know, about, you know, praying for this and praying for that and expecting God to give an answer and expecting increase and expecting, you know, X, Y, and Z. That's great to do, but don't expect that life is going to be peaches and roses as a believer. But we have this hope. We have this hope that this is not the end for us. And Paul said it like this, oh, that I may know him in the fellowship of his suffering, that that was something to be joyed over. So when I hear this question, why do the wicked prosper? I have to be honest and say, is it possible that there's some jealousy there? With those that have riches, is your trust in God or in money? And I don't mean to be offensive when I, when I ask this, because it's an honest question. Because also, I'd also like to add this. How many famous people, just in the last year, or off the top of your head, that were rich, that were wealthy, have committed suicide because they were empty inside? That's the difference between they might have all the world, but they're still empty because they don't have Jesus. All this money and riches, is it really prosperous to gain the whole world, to gain all this money and not have Jesus? I would say that it's not prosperous at all. Because you've done nothing. As Ecclesiastes says, that was the writer of Sol the writer was Solomon, who is renowned as the most wise man, gifted by God as, uh, with the wisdom of God. And what he concludes about all this, it's vanity. It's without purpose. It's without meaning. It's nothing if you don't have God, if you don't have 
Jesus. If you don't have his spirit. So I would say the wicked prospering really is not true prosperity. True prosperity, true wealth is to be washed in the blood of Jesus and have his fruit from his Holy Spirit moving and operating in your life. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Man, that was a great answer. The uh, first half about the scriptures uh, was interesting, but what really got me was that the second half of your answer, uh, it was really profound, and you actually uh, were like on the borderline of even preaching there. And so let's let's have a Sister Lisa follow up now, and she'll probably get it, give us some more preaching. Okay. Well, that was, that was great. Praise the Lord. Let me go. I know this comes up a lot. I think we've all done it. When we see other people prospering and we're, we're doing all we can to serve the Lord and we see the wicked. What, who was it? Was it David that said, when I see the prosperity of the wicked, my foot almost slipped. I, I don't remember who said that, but yeah, I always think of that scripture. So don't be discouraged. That's just part of your human condition. We look and we go, the grass seems to be over greener, greener over there, Lord. But just be careful because you might jump over there and find out it's artificial turf. Matthew 5, 47, that ye may be the children of your father in heaven. Let me read this in context because it's just started there. We go back to verse 42. Give to him that asketh of thee and to him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Ye have heard that, <clears throat> excuse me, it hath been said Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So this is just this is the way of the Lord, y'all. He allows the wicked to prosper. He allows the righteous to prosper. Um, it's not that God is doing anything to you. A lot of times these uh, persecutions, if you will, are actually things that are going to strengthen you in your faith. And you're not even looking at it the right way. Uh, and, and no, remember, I think it was James that said, um, let no man say that when he is tempted, he is tempted of God. That tempted actually means tempted, tested, or tried. So it's not the Lord, but he'll allow your proving. And we've seen in the Bible where the Lord allowed uh, other spirits or entities to go and do certain things. The Lord will allow the devil to do stuff to you or things to happen to you that will be approving for you. It's not even, it's not. It's a demonstration to the devils, first of all, that you truly do believe. <laughs> and then also to yourself. So the times of doubt, you can go back and look in your life and go, yeah, but when, when, the, when, when the devil tried to bring doubt and stuff, you go, but yeah, but wait a minute. I remember when. And then I did. And I prayed. And the Lord came through. One of, one of my favorite songs they have uh, when, when I'm going through stuff, I don't always play it, but sometimes I do, is uh, he didn't bring us this far to leave us. He didn't lift us up to let us down. <laughs> so, you know, I'll start singing that. And I remember, you know, to just hold on because he's going to get me through this storm. So I want to I'm going to go ahead and just read because I just love the word always encourages me. And for those of you that think of, that the wicked is prospering, let me show you what the Bible actually says about them. OK, let's go. to. There's plenty of passages. I'm just going to pick Psalm 37. A Psalm of David, fret not thyself because of evildoers. Oh, and actually, I'm, I was doing a video on this, and I'll be dropping it in a couple of days. So I'm just going to go ahead and say it here. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall so be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shall thou dwell in the land. And verily thou shalt be fed. 
Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who who bringeth wicked devices to pass? Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place. And it shall not be, but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart, and their bowels shall be broken. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. Woo, praise you, Jesus. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time and in the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke, shall they consume away. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not utterly Excuse me, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom and his tongue talketh judgment. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he is judged. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away, and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The end of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble, and the Lord shall help them and deliver them 
He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. Now, I hope all of that helped answer that person's question. Oh, whew. man, the answers are in the scriptures. You just need to know what part to read, right? Amen. That was beautiful. Yeah. Well, uh, that could be the last word, but we still need to give everybody a turn. So, uh, Angel, you haven't spoken yet. Sorry. So, well, again, the Steve took the words right out of my mouth because I was thinking, do they prosper? And then right toward the end of it, he, start, he started to say that. I was like, again, I don't, I, I, my brain's working too slowly to come up with something new to contribute, but it's the Lord confirming things. It's amazing to watch that. Like I'll have thoughts in my, in my mind that I'll be chewing over about my, you know, potential answer. And then somebody will say almost the very words. And I, and I just, to me, that's just a, a confirmation from the Holy spirit. Um, but uh, so I'll just, uh, because I don't want to go back over well-worn territory that everybody's covered so well. I'll just uh, quickly say, I have found, like, I, I'm actually not sat around thinking about the wicked prospering since being saved. Because you know why? Because I don't feel entitled to anything. I don't feel entitled. Uh, I feel like God has really humbled me in that way uh, and shown me the hard way that whatever I think I might be entitled to in this in this life it's you know he'll he'll uh, he'll make a point to 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 give me the very opposite if that's if that uh, expectation is is prideful and hypocritical and really it's childish and I see it all over the place today they're encouraging it they're um, cultivating this sense of entitlement and oh no fair that's not fair you know it's this uh kind of a kind of communist mentality of god never told us that the, that life would be fair and typically he'll hit, there's always a way that it, it, it that for god to show you that whatever you're sitting around thinking that you deserve he'll, he'll show you why you didn't even deserve it in the first place even if perhaps you could argue that you did it's that spirit of pride and entitlement and blindness and um, uh, uh, jealousy, uh, it's kind of a covetousness. And then it usually tends to, to, to come with a, uh, a bitter spirit and um, uh, it, it's like just, a, just this, uh, it's all over our, our society now, uh, especially with people my age where they are, um, consumed with this uh you know we saw like occupy wall street and they talk about the top one percent and all this stuff and like as if they are somehow entitled to well it's not fair that we have to work two jobs to 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 you know to pay our bills or this mentality i know it might seem different than watching you know why do the um the righteous suffer while the wicked prosper i mean first of all like i don't know who the wicked are uh in any given statement but you know a lot of times people will, will 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 just kind of get this build up this idea of like the other and uh, a, a, and kind of project all of these things on them. But, you know, we really don't know what's going on in their life and we don't know what God's using it for. You know, a lot of times uh, he has a plan that we can't see all the time. He always has a plan that we can't see. Uh, I, I see the thing that disturbs me with this question is I just uh, uh, since being brought to my knees enough to even even come to. to to receive uh, the gospel, believe it, um, and 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 you know believe God's word. Uh, there hasn't been a time where I felt so uh, so much uh, better than other people somehow. Even as a saint, I know I'm only a saint vicariously. I'm only righteous vicariously. It's Christ that's righteous. I just I just know that's true. I just believe He did what He what He said He did, and that's it. That's 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 the only difference between me and the quote unquote wicked. So I am not actually sitting around feeling like I'm entitled to more than, you know, the world, you know, I guess, you know, worldly people, unbelievers that I see that are, you know, may have more than me because, because I'm too busy being humbled of my own wickedness. I'm too busy, rec you know, recognizing my own shortcomings to where I, I don't get puffed up about other people 
or or even you know a, a lot of this uh, whole what we call oh, the deep state now i guess or the alumni this, this all, all powerful other you know wicked uh, uh construct where we kind of project all of this you know uh all of these thoughts onto this 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 sort of a amalgamation of all the you know the lost world these are all individuals that god has a plan for and really what we're talking about is spiritual wickedness we're talking about you know uh uh, uh unclean spirits that i i really do believe operate through through people um you know lost people especially in this world um but i i think that more important than understanding why why some you know people we might think are lost have more than us i think we should it's more important to examine why we're asking that question why we're worried about what they have or don't have why we think we deserve more than we do have because uh, i have eternal life i have a guaranteed happily ever after uh no doubt about it no 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 fear when i lay my head down at night i know god's gonna wipe away every tear at the end of the day i i I, I I would deserve chastening, I believe, if I were sitting around uh, been out of shape because I didn't think that I was getting what I quote unquote deserve in this life uh, uh, compared to, I don't know, uh, some neighbors that I, you know, and oftentimes we don't even know what they really believe or some some other person that I, I perceive to be lost and they and I perceive that they have more than me, uh, you know, if you catch yourself, you know, asking that question, stop worrying about what they have and start worrying about why why you would have the nerve to feel entitled to more than what god has has seen fit to give you uh, that's that's really where i'm at with that question i mean that's a and i think that's just like a really uh big lesson that the world the world especially uh millennials <laughs> uh you know people in my generation uh haven't really ever come to terms with and i see it i see it really causing destruction in our society right now really just uh running amok and uh uh yeah so anyway that, that that's uh that's me hmm. wow well a lot has been said and then after your turn i'm thinking wow is there what can she add to that and you did not disappoint sister that was a wonderful <laughs> point you made um <laughs> makes me ask the question for everybody um how much money would you be willing to sell your gift of eternal life for? Is there is there any amount of money where you would take and say, I'll, I'll, I'll take the money? <laughs> I don't think any of us would. There's any amount of money. that. So that when we understand that it's this gift of eternal life, the salvation is worth more than all of the gold in the world, uh, we then will understand how blessed we are. Uh, ben, you're the, the last one to answer this question. Well, you're in a tough position after following all that. I certainly am. I I, I was blown away by everyone's answers, um, and I needed to hear all of them. They're awesome. Um, and so I, I don't probably, I'm up. Yeah, it's, it's a tall order. Uh, but I, I also don't mind, too. If we only get to a couple questions every every week, I, I'm perfectly fine with that. I, I'd rather uh, get, you know, really exhaust a question, you know, get, you know, eat every little piece of, of uh, juice out of the squeeze every bit out of every juice out of the out of the fruit if we can. Um, one thing I wanted to uh, circle back on, Lisa talked about that. I don't know what what chapter you read in the Old Testament, but it's, where it said uh, 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 the righteous might fall, or something, something to the effect where uh, the righteous might fall, but he will not utterly fall because the Lord upholds him, and. Um, I want actually we're going to bring up that verse when I talk about the verse about call, make your calling an election sure because uh, Renee did a video about that a couple of days ago based on a discussion she and I had and I, we were talking about that you know the calling election sure the word sure there basically means to strengthen or fortify if you look up that same word and as it's used in other scriptures it basically means to fortify or strengthen uh, and, and by saying making your calling election sure uh, he's basically saying. Uh, yeah, so you won't stumble into apostasy. You'll never stumble because at the very end of that verse or the, that chapter, he says, uh, he basically tells them, hey, uh, because you know these false teachers are coming ahead of time, I'm telling you ahead of time, this is coming, um, that you will uh, not fall, you will not fall from your own steadfastness. And again, people will say, oh, yeah, see, if you fell uh, into apostasy, 
uh, it means you're never saved. Well, your own steadfastness, uh, I don't think our own steadfastness uh, factors into our salvation. Uh, Ephesians says it's not of ourselves. So it's not our own steadfastness. Um, but that word steadfastness ties back to the word sure. So uh, make your calling election sure. Make it steadfast, steadfast, strengthen it. Um, and then so you won't fall from your own steadfastness. But if you do fall from your own steadfastness, no matter how far you fall, you will not utterly fall because the Lord upholds the righteous. So that is a guarantee by God. So I just wanted to circle back on that. But um, with regards to this question, we know that God has an economy and Satan has an economy. Uh, God's economy is grace where it gives. Grace obligates the giver, but not the recipient. Whereas law is, uh, that's Satan's economy, essentially. Law is Satan's economy where it's always an exchange. It's a mutual exchange. So both parties are obligated. That's why you have all these uh, these uh, covenant rituals where uh, animals was slaughtered in the Old Testament. Uh, and a, it was a visible sign that both people would partake in. Whereas grace, God only obligated himself. In fact, uh, uh, Abraham was asleep. He couldn't even do anything to, uh, to participate in, in, with regards to obligating himself under that uh, that covenant. So uh, we know, again, that idea that I'm trying to relate here is God has an economy, it's grace. Satan has economy, and it's a law or, or bondage. Um, and we know that Satan has the power over death, and death is the consequence of violating the law. So the Bible says that Satan does have the power over death. Um, and what we see in the Bible is uh, the law the law is always an exchange. You do this, I'll do this. Uh, if you don't do it, you're cursed. If you do do it, you're blessed. And what? And all the language we hear about in the Bible about Satan is that he, you know, the mark of the beast is you cannot buy or sell. Again, that's that's do, uh, that's economy. That's, a, that's the world economy. That's Satan's economy, where you obligate both people. You're buying and selling. It's an exchange. Uh, but the Bible talks about Satan trafficked in the souls of men. Trafficking, again, is buying and selling. Um, whereas God's economy, uh, for example, is, um, he says, for example, in Isaiah, uh, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the watchers. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk with without money and without price. So the God uses the word buy. But it's not, it, it's only, it's free. It's free. Whereas Satan, it's it's a mutual exchange. And what's, a reason I'm tying this all in there is that you pe look at people in the world who look at their prospering, and let's face it, uh, I think, you know, we, we, know the, we know the Jews, they know the law very well. Uh, the occult studies the Bible very well. I think they, they want to understand and tap into the, the, uh, the law, the, 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 the law, the law of mutual exchange. That's why we find, I think, it's not a coincidence that many of the most wealthy people in the world uh, are Jewish people, because uh, they understand that law. They understand they they understand the law. They understand how to bind people, put people into bondage through financial schemes and things like that. And so does the cult. The cult knows that too. So uh, that's again, that's Satan's realm. Uh, and Jesus said, you know, it, uh, you know, what does a profit a man? What does a profit a man if he uh, gains the whole world, but uh, loses his own soul. And that word soul there basically means life. Uh, and it, 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 it could have eternal consequences or temporal consequences. Um, but uh, again, you see that word exchange. What will you do for exchange of soul? Well, if you gain the whole world, it, you, you really lose your life because you're, you're, you're spending, you're busy all, with all your time managing your goods and keeping track of that, of all your goods and a wise man once said that you know more more money more problems, <laughs> and uh, the uh, so the again the the, the it's, it's it may look like they're prospering, but ultimately it's it's temporal. It, it, it not not only that it just bring, puts them into, into greater bondage. They may look like they're prospering, but again they they're really just in more bondage. They have no life. They have no spiritual life, and it, it could have eter eternal consequences if they don't. Uh, finally believe on Christ. And it, it, whereas believers, again, through grace, we suffer, but uh, we may suffer. In fact, Philippians 1.9, uh, or I'm sorry, Philippians 1.29 says, 
but again, this is a, a specific message to this specific church. It doesn't mean it, it applies to all believers. It may apply to believers today, but it doesn't mean all believers of all time. This is a formula that all believers are going to experience. But he says, Paul says in Philippians 129, for it has been granted, again, granted is a gift actually, on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Uh, and so th this church was granted the privilege of suffering for Christ. And it, we, we should consider it a privilege because it, it, it not only, uh, you know, it's our sure, just and, and, and uh, right. Um, it, uh, it's what our, uh, I forgot the exact word the Bible uses, but it's, it's our, um, it's totally appropriate given what Christ has done for us. And so, but not only that, we can earn eternal rewards for it. And so we should consider it a gift and uh, when we suffer. And in fact, for me in particular, when I suffer, it's usually not the physical form or financial or anything else. The way I suffer is when uh, there's a Bible verse that I don't understand and I want to understand it. Uh, that's one thing, you know, where I get my spiritual insights is when I'm, God knows I, I, I'm humble and I want to understand. That's all I want to do is understand. And that's when he grants me the, the, the understanding. Um, cause I, 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 he knows I'm desperate and I can't grow and I can't move forward in my walk with him until I understand it. And there's sometimes there's a, a read a verse and just, I, in fact, a couple of days ago, I was reading a verse in revelation. It just really troubled me cause I didn't, I, I, I don't, I, I don't like when it's ambiguous. I want to be very precise and accurate and I, I don't, I don't have satisfaction until I have that. And, um, I thought I would never get past it, but I should have known because every time this happens, uh, every time I, I suffer like this, you know, it'll be two or three days where I'm just. I can't think about anything else. I'm just thinking about it over and over again. And uh, it's, it's in that sense, it's kind of torment in that, in that respect, but it shouldn't be torment. And it, as I've gotten, it's happened more and more. I, I learned from it is that you know, I actually look forward to it now. I actually enjoy it because I know God's going to give me a big breakthrough. And it always, it, inevitably it does. In fact, I got my big breakthrough, you know, because one of the reasons I was suffering is like, okay, well, I, I don't, I don't have any other, other data points to draw on to under, to inform what this passage is saying. And then uh, I, you know, it seemed impossible. It seemed impossible that I was never going to get understanding. And then lo and behold, I said, it popped into my mind. Oh, let's look at the second, let's look at uh, uh, John's epistles, second John and, th and, and the, the third epistle, three John, which no one ever reads. <laughs> and I actually found my answer in those, uh, those, um, those obscure epistles. It gave me exactly what my answer was. And it just had a, a, a huge, I'm still reeling from the, uh, implications of what I discovered, but um, so in that says that's what I suffer from it. But it's a good thing because also too, First Peter says that it uh, that you know for this time being that you might be um, uh, let me see here talk to second first uh, let me see that we have various trials and that that it basically that and we should, we should consider all joy because. It's a test of, of our faith and our endurance. It's, it's to make us uh, so that we will we'll endure. And, and that, that endurance, God knows that our test, our faith needs to be tested. Otherwise, we won't grow. And I, I could test to that because, again, I will. if I knew, if I felt like I understood the Bible, I'd probably stop reading it. And God knows that. Um, or I wouldn't be mo as motivated. But when I have a burning question, he'll know I'll dig into that word and I'll, and I'll, I'll along the way, I'll discover all other, all, all kinds of other things that I want to understand and, and uh, more revelation. And so that's, uh, again, I think we should consider all joy when we are tested. And uh, even though it might not be pleasant for the time being, he always does it for our good. And if we keep that in mind, uh, we, we really should be joyous about it. And, and so God doesn't always suffer for the sake of suffering. Like, Oh, well, uh, you know, you need to be humble. Well, sometimes it may be because you need to be humbled, uh, but it's always for our good is I guess what I'm saying. And, and that um, worldly good is no good for us at all, but uh, spiritual suffering can be uh, very beneficial, not only in this life, but uh, for the one to come. Okay. All right. Thank you, brother. Um, I uh, copied and pasted a question from the chat room, brother Ben, if you could, look at it and save it and so that we can uh, add it to our Sunday questions. It's from uh, Chris Seok. Is Satan in this context a loyal prosecutor or a demon who seeks destruction of souls? 
Uh, so that's the question uh, that uh, we can add to the Sunday list. So Chris, uh, you know, make sure you're there on Sundays because that's that's the, where the, your question will be answered. Um, all right, well, I think we can try answering one more question, but uh, we'll probably have to ask the, the, the answer to be more concise in four or five minutes maybe. Otherwise, uh, we won't be able to get everybody uh, uh, in uh, have a turn. Uh, so let's keep our answers a little bit more concise on this last question so we can go end at the regular time. Uh, but Ben, what's the next question? Okay, I, I picked a kind of a fun question. I think it's a fun question. And so I don't think, I also think our answer would be relatively short. And it is true or false, many great rock structures such as Devil's Tower are really giant tree stumps. <laughs> That's my question, by the way. So, mm -hmm. okay, uh, I guess I'll go first because I, uh, uh, my answer was is so short. Uh, I, I know almost nothing about this. I did see some story about it on uh, YouTube uh, or somewhere uh, talking about this whole idea, but I didn't really follow it and. Uh, so I, I wouldn't I have to just say undecided, and I'd like to hear what everybody else has to has to say. Okay, who would like to go next? I'll go ahead and say um, uh, I'm undecided as well. Uh, yeah, I'll say uh, I'm. I don't know how to answer this question because I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm leaning toward the, to the idea that there are some structures such as Devil's Power and others that at the very least, they are not what we're told they are. I don't know if they're giant tree stumps. I don't, it's possible, um, definitely possible that, that uh, creation was, a, you know, a, had, a, had a much grander scale to it perhaps sometime in the past before the flood. And um, if you guys are interested in some of this stuff, I, I would check out uh, Mud Fossils, Mud Fossil University. I think that's a lot more interesting than the idea of just giant trees in the past, because I think uh, either God symbolizes uh, a spiritual reality uh, in the very rocks uh, of creation um, by uh, if, if you look into these mud fossils you'll see it's either somehow uh, symbolism from God and designed to confound the scoffers the mockers when uh, intricate uh, uh, details of the human anatomy are preserved in these uh, lithographic structures that we're told are just happenstance we're told that they are uh just uh you know it's just pareidolia we're just wrecking you know we're just making patterns with our mind or whatever but um the more you look into this whole mud fossils thing you'll see that there's something to it there's something some people think these are petrified giants something to do with the story of medusa it, it, who knows uh, i just know that it, it could be it could be uh that, you know, we know God is the, you know, he handmade the, you know, the entire earth uh, and everything has meaning. I love to look at, I love to look at the animals and stuff and, and try to figure out what lesson each animal is meant to teach mankind, each type of different animal. And I see them all the time. I, there's a lesson in every, every little bit of creation. Um, and so uh, when it comes to the giant tree stumps, I'm not really sure, but I, it wouldn't surprise me. I wouldn't surprise me if some of those things really are the remains of giant trees. Uh, I don't think that uh, that should, you know, I think even even some scientists allow for this with the Carboniferous period, I think so. Uh, but I'll just say leaning true, I guess, to split the difference. Leaning true, okay. All right, uh, who would like to go next? Uh, has anybody actually studied this subject much? No, I, I am a complete, what's the word? Oh, I can't think of that word. It's actually like more intricate. I can't think of it. It's like you have the word erudite, and then you have the other one. It's like it's completely. It's a beautiful word. I just can't remember. Oh, neophyte. 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 I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. Like, I'll even say ignoramus on this one because I, 
I don't know. I looked into it a little bit. It, it's like, eh, I'm not a hundred. It's like, I don't know. Some of it gets me lost, but it's not something I'm, uh, you know, unwilling to discuss. So on this one, I would, I would have to say undecided. So I'm going to keep my answer real short. I enjoy Sister Angel's answer though. She's, yes, I don't even know if we could even bring up a topic. Sister Angel go, oh, I've never heard of that before. I don't even think we could. I think we should have a question and answer night. Be like, can we stump Sister Angel? <laughs> Every time I say something, she knows she knows at least a little a bit about it. Game. That <laughs> it's not possible to stump her. Come on. It's not impossible. Bring up anything mathematical. No, it's not, it's not possible to stump her. I don't think it is. At oh. least that she would go. I know what that is, and she can define it. Now she might not even she might not go you know on for days about it, which I find highly questionable as well. Because usually you ask her, you're gonna get a long answer, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna get more information than a little bit. But uh, I haven't seen her go. I don't know about that, Lisa. Tell me. Every time I ask her, she knows about it, so she takes all the fun out of it. I don't think I could play like Jeopardy <laughs> or anything, <laughs> anything like could that with Angel. Yeah, I think I would lose. <laughs> So my uh, answer is undecided. <laughs> okay, thank you. I appreciate your laugh uh, with your answer too. All right, Sister Heather, do you know anything about this? Actually, when I heard the question, my shoulders went up and I my hands went up and I was like, what is that? So I Googled it and it looks like a giant tree stump. That's about as much information as I have right now. Yeah. Okay. Well, Ben, uh, we, we wanted a, a question that would um, we could give short answers to, but uh, this is ridiculous. Uh, yeah. Okay. This question really let's, fell over. Let me see who hasn't. Uh, Steve. Steve. I bet that Steve knows about it. Come on, Steve. Hmm. Okay. What are we gonna do about Steve being a little slow on the trigger here? Is there is there any kind of disciplinary action we can institute against him? <laughs> sorry, sorry, I didn't realize you said my turn. My bad, my bad. Um, uh, I, I looked, I looked it up. I cheated because I had no idea anything with this question. And uh, uh, one thing Hendrick said in the chat that I do know to be true, that uh, trees uh, old enough, they will fossilize. Uh, a, a perfect example of this would be the redwood forest. Uh, so and I, I used to have as a kid, because we, my, my family went there, went to went all over the United States to several different national parks and, and saw lots of the awesome, you know, things of God's creation and whatnot. And so I used to have a piece of fossilized, uh, tree rock. Uh, so that's interesting. And I looked at it. It really does look like a tree stump. It really does. So I don't know. Maybe. Does it matter? I just, I just like, why do they call it the devil's rock? That's what yeah. weirds me out. Yep. Why? It's all. Why all couldn't they call it the Jesus rock or something? I mean, you know. But then somebody would have a problem with that. So I mean, you know. But uh, you know, I just or or God's God's magnificent rock uh, forming creation. Uh, <laughs> that would be cool. But that's uh, you know that's not as catchy as the devil's rock, uh, but. <laughs> well, there, uh, from, what, from what I learned about it, uh, just from watching a little sh show about it for, and I didn't even watch the whole thing. As I said, uh, I don't think there's just one uh, example of this. I think that this is a a broader subject about the, yeah. the, the concept of uh, there was a time where uh, things were so large that, uh, you know, we, we know that there were giants, or at least I think we all agree that there were giants. Uh, and uh, uh, not only that, animals and plant life, trees grew to immense sizes too. 
And so this idea that it's uh, this petrified is uh, is proof, proof. It's evidence that this this is the case. That things were larger, maybe before the flood, before the environment changed. And that's I don't even know if I'm saying any, anything correct. Mm. That yeah, mm. that's that's what I that's what I gathered. Mm. That's that's you know quite quite a fantastic point. You know, uh, the flood changed a lot of things. And, uh, you know, they, they talk about, you know, every every single civilization that has some type of historical record has a record of the flood in some form or variation. And, you know, that the, the scientists that have looked into it, and especially those that are Christians, you know, uh, and even those that aren't, you know, conclude if they're studying it not from an evolutionary theory standpoint that it took millions and millions of years, but that it took pressure to form a lot of these fossils. And so there's a lot of proof of the flood scientifically if you look at it from the weight of the water that would have created some of these fossilized things. So it's very possible that that is left over from the pressurization of the water that was on the earth uh, and knocked off a big tree trunk. And that's what's left. So uh, that, 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 I'm glad you went there, Luke, because I think that's great. Um, you know, I think there's more proof of the Bible in, in science than, than a lot of the secular scientists would, would like you to believe. I think science proves the Bible, not the other way around. Um, well, and the Bible proves science, but that's because God made it. But I do believe science will prove and does prove the validity of scripture. Um, but, uh, I just throw a couple things out real quick from the last answer. Psalm 73 uh, study the book of Jeremiah and uh, the same verses uh, Heather read earlier about about uh, the Jesus saying store up treasures in heaven um, and and not on the earth and that's where our, tr our treasure should be and that's where our minds should be to seek first the kingdom of heaven and that all these things will be added unto us as we need them so Okay. Amen. Thank uh, you. I, thank you, brother. I, I, I will say in case uh, someone is not aware of it, uh, on my channel, Brother Luke, uh, I have uh, uh, about about 60 playlists now. And uh, one of the playlists is titled Science, God, and the Bible. Uh, if you're someone that's, say, either looking into Christianity and the Bible or Let's say that you're a new believer, but you have questions about, you know, is the, uh, Christianity, is it conflict with science? Uh, go to that playlist. Uh, there's, about, I think, 100 or more than 100 videos on there that, that'll just blow your mind when you see how the, the science does prove the Bible and there is no conflict. But you, you'll be shocked with uh, the, the, what creation, well, the Bible does tell us that creation is proof of God. So... <clears throat> Uh, all right. I guess if there's anybody wants to say anything more about this question, uh, I'll, I'll have to give my quick answer. Oh yeah, Bear, I'm sorry, I forgot to get your answer. You're probably the expert on this, aren't you? Well, no, it's, uh, it's just something I looked into. Uh, I thought more people would be familiar with Devil's Tower. It is the, the it is a real place. It's the, the movie um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where that UFO Steven Spielberg uh, did a video. Uh, that movie scared the living crap out of me as a young kid. Um, uh, it, the, the UFO lands on top of Devil's Tower, and uh, it's, that's where that's why one of the reasons it's kind of famous or uh, it's kind of an icon. Um, but yeah, I like to study this creation science stuff. I think it's interesting. I like to try to pe put the, you know put together the past and what it was like. Um, but yeah, I, th I think it, I mean one thing I don't think is a tree. I mean, I'm not I'm not ruling anything out. But I don't think it's a tree uh, that would require an awful giant chainsaw. <laughs> uh, for that, for it to be clean, clean sheared off like that, or even just a regular saw, or there were some significant, real, real giants. <laughs> if that was the case, but um, don't rule anything out. But uh, I think 
I tend to think that, um, well, I think one people, a lot of people think that the flood was just a, 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 a rain occurred just from rainfall. And I think that was only a small part of it. I, the, the says the fountains of the great deep burst open. And I think that was like, uh, you know, super megaton bomb, several from all over the world. It was just, it was just catastrophic. I mean, it was just, they burst open. In fact, I wonder sometimes if, the, if they burst open so high, if it didn't actually, and then this is, this is, I don't know, this is maybe too going too far, but uh, that they, the, the fountains went so high that actually some of it hit the moon. And that's why, and the moon was kind of partially flooded. And those aren't actually meteor marks, but they're actually uh, the, the first surface of the moon, for example, would kind of got muddy essentially like a, a thin layer of, of mud. And, those were like bubble pops and now those are the craters um even on planet earth the craters that we find here they they there's like really, every time they there's a couple of uh, craters you can visit and the and the meteor they show you that caused the crater is like so ridiculously small uh and it it it, it, it there's it just seems fanciful and made up completely that the that the crater they say caused the giant uh uh uh, crater was uh, was you know the, the meteor was like the size of I don't know, uh, like a loaf of bread, you know. Um, and so I and I, I tend to think that those were also caused caused by the flood, where the the surface of the earth got mud. You know, after the after the flood, as the water subsided, the you know the earth, surface of the earth was muddy, and there was gases caught underneath the, the mud, and they popped, and they caused those um, those craters. They're not actually meteors at all. Uh, and also, too, that would also explain if, if the if the uh, fountains of the Great Deep did shoot up, up real high. Um, I don't know if some, some, I think me, what, I don't know if it's comets or meteors, but one of those is um, they are. They, I think it's comets. They're actually the so called science so called says they're ice. They're basically gi gi giant ice formations, and so. If if the fountains of the great deep uh, were were burst open and the windows of heaven were open, like the firmament somehow opened up and there's water escaped up into there, I don't know. Pure speculation. That might explain why we have these comets that are ice, um, in in uh in the atmosphere or the heavens. I, again, I don't, I don't completely understand it. The Devil's Tower. Uh, I I've heard it. Uh, some people have creation scientists who have studied it basically speculate that it could have been an ancient uh, volcano because they, they, they see a lot of vulcanization that occurred during the flood um, that would have, it would have naturally have occurred just based, based on all the upheaval. And there was a volcano and there's a thing in geology known as planation surface surfaces. You see that all over the world where mountains will be like clear sheen cut off, right? It's like, it's like, you know, someone took a chainsaw to, to the tips of them and they speculate that that even secular science speculates that was cut off by water. So the, I believe the, the earth was really flooded and the, actually most of the mountains, uh, the, I don't think the earth was all that mountainous before the flood and that the, the uh, mountains came up after the flood and as part of the, the, the upheaval, and water was, you know, the flood was very dynamic and it lasted for, you know, the, the settling of the waters probably took hundreds of years. And during that time, water's being shifted back and forth at various uh, locations. And um, th that shifting back and forth caused these, these planation services where it cuts off the top of mountains. And, uh, and, and, and that Devil's Tower would be a, an ancient volcano, essentially, that kind of hardened up early on. And that, but these these shifting waters cut the top of it off, and then the water subsided over time, and all that's left is this cone, or you know, the, the inner um, the inner part of the of, of the volcano. Uh, um, if it is if it is a volcano, that would kind of make sense why it's Devil's Tower. It's uh, uh, the lake of fire, essentially lava, lake of fire. I don't know. Um, so I thought it's kind of a fun question. I like that. I like to think about that kind of thing and try to peel back what it was like uh, not so long ago. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. I think tonight's going to go down in history for a couple of reasons. Uh, I'll tell you more when I give my closing remarks here, but let's, let's start doing that now. Let's uh, give our uh, summary thoughts on the study tonight or oh, I don't know the fellowship tonight. This is not really a study. It's so casual. Uh, so, 
but I think we succeeded in having a lot of fun, didn't we? Let, let's let's start off with uh, Brother Stephen. Why don't you give us your summary remarks? Oh boy! Oh boy! <laughs> I got to the microphone button quick this time, okay, everybody in the chat? <laughs> I saw you picking on me. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, uh, just a few comments. Great answers um, uh, all around. And, and uh, I, I do want to actually, you know, praise God for the mute button because... I, w I would have, uh, on, on a few of the answers, uh, uh, especially uh, Lisa's and, and Heather's and Angel's and, well, all of them, uh, but uh, uh, th there were a few times I was extremely moved and I, I would have been rather disruptive with my exuberant uh, glories and hallelujahs and amens and, and even... Uh, some utterances that no one would understand, um, but God, uh, or an interpretation gifting. Um, but uh, that being said, uh, if we have time, I, I wanted to read Psalm 73, but I'll wait to, to see if we have time and if you'll let me. Uh, but uh, otherwise, great, great answers. And I loved what Ben said about, you know, doesn't really matter how many questions we get through as long as we basically, you know, exhaust the, ans the, the answers because the answers are what's important really with the question. So that's, that's what I'll uh, conclude with there. And uh, the gospel uh, as well, that'll be my final thing. The gospel is... Jesus died for all, all sin, past, present, and future. He was buried, and he rose again. And if you believe in him, the, he wipes your sin from your account and imputes you with his righteousness, and thereby granting you eternal life that is sealed forever. Amen. Amen. That's what we were talking about before we went live. Uh, the I, idea of uh, we should be able to give a gospel message in a minute or less. Uh, it doesn't require a half hour or an hour of uh, um, you know deep theological teaching for a person to understand the gospel and believe and be saved. And that was a perfect example of it, brother. Uh, thank you for that. Um, let's see if... Uh, uh, Brother Ben, let me get you out of order here. I, you know, a lot of times you go last, so let me see if I can catch you off guard. Uh, can you give us a, your summary? Sure. I had a lot of fun. I, I really love the answers tonight. I uh, really love the answers tonight by everyone, which is mind-blowing. Um, and I don't have a YouTube much to say at the end, so I'll, I'll keep it short and uh, give time to Steve to read the psalm. Okay. Very considerate of you. Maybe you have some yeah, some spiritual growth that's going on. What do you think, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Sister Heather. I have really enjoyed the the um, fun, absolute fun that we've had tonight. Um, the questions were great. Um, everybody's answers were great. Um, that's pretty much all I got. Lots of fun. I look forward to this all week. And uh, oh, and um, Brother Steve, thank you so much for giving the gospel message. Sometimes I feel like during the Fun Friday Fellowship, um, that is the one thing that we're missing at the end is is somebody to give the gospel. And I really enjoyed that you did that. That was awesome. Yes, I, I, he, he's a, a true evangelist at heart, and he cannot help himself. Right, Steve? Amen. Thank you. I appreciate that from both of you. I really do. Thank you. Okay. I can't. Right. I can't help myself. You're yeah. right. No, I really can't. <laughs> I remember Paul saying, what was me? I do not preach the gospel. What mm. was uh, Okay, let me see. We got... Uh, uh ben and steve and angel so that no no uh, heather so that leaves angel and 
Lisa. Uh, let's save Lisa for, for last so she can tell us about Saturday. Angel, how about going next? Well, um, yeah, I, I want to give time uh, to Steve also to read the song. So I will just tell you guys I love you, and it's been a joy to be here as always. Uh, and I'm um, definitely looking forward to tomorrow. hope you guys will be there. And uh, Steve is just so full of uh, so full of the Holy Spirit. And every time we every time we we do a show with him, it's amazing. He never he never runs out of his passion for for the simplicity we have in Christ. So I uh, I just think it'll be a blessing to 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 hear some more of his uh, preaching, really, uh, before before we close out here. So I will just forfeit my time and uh, can't wait to see you guys tomorrow. Mm hmm. Yeah, full of the Holy Spirit, so much so that ecstatic utterances are yes. made from him. Uh, all right, Sister Lisa. I just thought I'd go slow to get to the mic so Steve wouldn't be left alone, uh, <laughs> you, you, feeling Steve, alone. Steve, Steve, that's a really an example of spiritual growth there, Steve. <laughs> Steve and Lisa are such kindred spirits. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, tomorrow night uh, on For the Most High Jesus channel, we're going to be talking about monarchs, uh, which will be programming. A lot of people thought when we talked about the monarch butterflies <laughs> that that's what we were going to be talking about. But tomorrow we will be talking about that as well as men. I'm not going to go into detail about what. We're going to talk about men. So that'll give you a little mystery. So you show up and find out, what is she going to say about men? So that'll be tomorrow night, 8 p.m. on the broadcast for Late Night with Lisa and Friends, 8 p.m. Pacific. And that's 11 p.m. Eastern. And that would be, what, 10 p.m. Central. So uh, please mark it on your calendars or your reminder if you want to check it out. That's tomorrow night. Again, we're going to be talking about monarchs. Late, uh, also men, and then also uh, whatever comes up, because sometimes we just start talking about stuff and we just talk about it. There'll be some more helpful tips that I think you guys will enjoy. And I'll try another shot or two at a, at a sense of uh, humor with uh, some jokes. And I'm going to try to get Ben to tell one. <laughs> Y'all write it down. I'm going to try to get Ben to tell one tomorrow. So I hope you guys will join us. I think we'll have a lot of fun. That's all I have to say. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're having so much fun that your fun meter is rivaling our fun. Well, I hope you won't be disturbed by that, brother Luke. I think I, there's enough fun to go know, around. I, I want Fridays to be the 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 the, the uh, penultimate fun place. Well, that's okay because mine's is on Saturday, so you're good. <laughs> the penultimate fun place. <laughs> <laughs> all right. No, I'm not. I'm not jealous and coveting all the fun. Okay. No, that's fine. But see, yours is on Friday. Then everybody can recover from all the, you know, laughter and their side aching, and then come over on all Saturday. Those, those crazy jokes Luke tells. Yeah, kind of all <laughs> oh, by the way, all the laughing, thank you. all the laughter. <laughs> thank you, Sister Angel, because I forgot to ask Brother Luke before I jump off here, Brother Luke. You always mention that you have a playlist for this or that or the other thing. Somebody mentioned something. Brother Luke goes, I have a playlist for that. So what I wanted to know was, do you have a playlist for your jokes? Oh, he needs to. The world needs that. I think the world needs it. Oh. <laughs> oh, that was great. First of all, I want to say that your uh, uh, use of the term uh, jokes is is quite generous of you because uh, some would not consider jokes in it. it they, they don't really laugh. But uh, I'm glad that there are. <laughs> oh, we laugh. The couple that do <laughs> laugh either with me or at me. Either way, it's okay with me. Yeah. As long as, you know, I, I, I read something once years ago that, um, and I believe this is true. Uh, they say that uh, uh, when a person smiles or, or laughs, that it, it causes endomorphins in their brain to be released. And it's a um, morphine is, I guess that's a type of morphine or something. The effect that you get is 
you know, happy, giddy, elation. Um, and that's what happens when we smile. And they did a test. And they wanted to see if the smile had to be um, a, a real smile or if you could just lift the corners of your mouth up like that, even though I just, all I did was lift the corners of my mouth up. And they discovered that even by the corners of your mouth coming up, even if it wasn't an actual smile, it still caused your brain to think you're smiling and you got this release of endomorphins. So uh, I would say that that's why I, often in public, if, if, if I'm dealing with someone in public and they, they greet me with a smile, I always stop and say, thank you. Thank you. Your smile is a great gift. I really appreciate that. It really was wonderful. And uh, they're, they're usually quite happy to, to get recognized in that way. But that's why I consider smiles. And not only when we smile, it makes us happy, but it makes other people happy to receive your smile. Um, okay, that was uh, out of the blue. That was awesome, Brother Luke. Thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, uh, regarding the, the program tonight, I did say that this was kind of a record-breaking uh, program for us on a Friday night because I, th I think we only had two and a half questions. And the last one was not... Uh, didn't require much answer on uh, by anybody, but uh, the others certainly made up for it. Did, was there a third question? Or was that am I right? The two, and then the last one, right? We had three total. We had counting the last one was three. Yes. Yeah. So you you want me to give you full credit for that question, Ben? <laughs> no. I'm only counting it as a half a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> That was funny, Brother Luke. See, I was on mute. That was funny, Brother Luke. <laughs> Let's put that on my playlist. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, so the point I'm making is that uh, in uh, two and a half hours, we, uh, we, uh, we really spent almost all that time answering two questions. And, 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 and not, at one, not for one moment was I bored or disinterested. Everybody's answer was just fantastic. I, I, I really, I don't think I've ever seen a time where the quality of the answers were were so so perfect at all times. So what a wonderful thing for all of us. Uh, uh, that's uh, that's a standard though. I hope we can we can continue. Uh, that's the kind of especially other... considering that you know we're in a situation where we, you know this is, uh, the ministry we've had a hostile military takeover. Apparently, according to some people, you're uh, you're you staged a coup. So it's amazing to see how <laughs> how, uh, how happy and uh, how how well uh, how well everybody's getting along. I think it's uh, I think that it's just been a really great synergy uh, with especially having Heather on the panel uh, and at you know Steve and Heather. It's amazing how God just like brought brought uh, brought all of this at once and it all just worked out too. You know, just the way that people can come on the panel and it you know uh we're doing it live so you know i know it never never gets awkward or uh uncomfortable that i've seen i mean you know i know that you were kind of well when you're taking the call-ins that, that, that i think that was what was happening you were taking random call-ins at first when when you first started but now i mean you know this is this is all live this is uh not rehearsed or planned and everybody just gels it's amazing yeah yeah Ke kevin was really great too when he was on um thank so, you yeah Yep. Thank you, sister. Well said. And that, that is true. Uh, Kevin filled in last week was he was a yes. wonderful addition to the, the panel. And I'm sure we'll we'll uh, invite him to come on uh, uh, whenever there's an opportunity. Uh, so I guess that's it. Uh, now, uh, Steve. Uh, oh, by the way, so you got tomorrow night on Lisa's uh, channel. Don't miss that. Uh, uh, late night with just with Lisa and friends. Uh, and then don't forget on Sunday, we have our regular church service. That's at 5 p.m. Eastern time on uh, the same channel, Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, and so, Steve, uh, let's, let's hear your, your the, the psalm. Okay, great. And uh, thank you to all of you that had such kind words toward me. I really appreciate it and I'm humbled. Uh, that's wonderful. Thank you. That means a lot to me. Um, for I know, uh, I, I know, I know the wretched man that I am that, that, and am just so astounded that, that through God's work in my life, 
as a believer that he causes y'all to see him in me. And that's what I think. So just thank you. Um, Psalm 73, a Psalm of Asaph. Truly God is good to Israel. And we are the children of Abraham as in Israel. Even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their deaths, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people re return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how does God know? And there is and is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in, innoc in, innoc in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say... I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until, until, until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then un understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castedst them down into destruction, how they are brought into desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my veins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually, nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward, and afterward, receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My heart and my, fle my flesh and my heart faileth, but God, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust, I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Amen. 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 Yeah, we all say amen. Okay. All right, that's a wonderful way to end the program. Uh, so I want to thank everybody on the panel and also everybody in the chat room. I, there was a message from Brother Kevin that the, ch the chat room was operating wonderfully. So there were I, a lot of, see, tonight I was pretty much uh, focusing just on the conversation, just trying to listen intently uh, rather than paying so much attention to the chat room. What I've found uh, uh, I've been guilty of uh, trying to uh, do both, uh, participate in the panel and the chat room, and then I find out that when I watch the program back the next day, that I missed 
more than half of the conversation. And so uh, as much as I want to be engaged in the chat room, uh, it's really at the expense of listening. And when I listen to the program back, I realize it was even better than I thought because I had missed so much that uh, it really is quite profound, I believe, that uh, what uh, what is being said on our programs. So thank you, Lord Jesus, uh, for this wonderful panel, this wonderful fellowship that we have. and. Um, Look forward to next time we're together. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.